Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer. O Spirit of God, set at rest the crowded, hurrying, anxious thoughts within our minds and our hearts. That the peace and quiet of your presence take possession of us. Help us to rest, to relax, to become open and receptive to you. You know our innermost thoughts. You know our inmost spirits, the hidden unconscious life within us, the frustrated desires, the unresolved tensions and dilemmas. Cleanse and sweeten the springs of our being that freedom, life, and love may flow into both our conscious and our hidden life. Lord, we lie open before you, waiting for your peace, your healing, and your word. Amen. 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 So today is uh, a lay Sunday, and that means that your speaker lacks any theological credentials. I have, I have never darkened the door of the seminary, but I did preach once when I was about 19 years old. There was a congregation near my home church that was without a regular minister. A nearby Christian university provided a Sunday morning preacher, but le that left a vacancy for the rest of the week. Now, if you know anything about church in the South, Sunday morning service like this, this is just the warm-up for the rest of the week. <laughs> there is a Sunday morning Sunday school, morning worship. There would be a Sunday evening Bible study, or in our case, song practice. Uh, Sunday night worship again, midweek Bible study, or as we would call it, Bible Bites. And um, if it was summertime, there would be these week-long revival meetings. I'm sorry that uh, Vicki Matthews is not here to nod knowingly because she knows she would know what I'm talking about. Now, during this particular congregation's transition, uh, the nearby congregations would adjust their Sunday evening worship hour to allow members time to uh, attend the nearby congregation's Sunday evening service, and that would provide support and encouragement to them. That particular Sunday night's preacher had been very cleverly secured the Sunday night before by Elder Taylor who would stand up before the closing hymn, he would gaze out over the congregation, zero in on an adult baptized male, and ask, Brother, would you preach for us next Sunday night? <laughs> well, you can figure out the rest of this story. It's, it's hard to say no when you've got the eyes of 50 or 60 church members trained on you. So I spent a week in anguish, literally trying to compose a sermon and prepare for what I knew would be the inevitable attack of butterflies. <laughs> Somehow I got through it, and afterwards I was thanked profusely by Elder Taylor, who pressed $15 into my hand. Now there was some back and forth, but I finally prevailed politely and firmly, refusing this stipend for preaching. It's not that I was insulted at $15, because at that time it would have filled up the gas tank of my little Ford Mustang with a little money left over. I was actually afraid if I accepted it, they might invite me back. <laughs> now, fortunately, Bill Davidson has not been, uh, has not, not had to resort to such tactics to fulfill, to fill the uh, pulpit on Sunday morning, so thank you, Bill. So bottom line is my credentials are thin. The focus of today's commentary that I've chosen is a spiritual journey uh, subtitled Ant Pearl in the Oregon, and we'll talk about Ant Pearl a little bit later. I would like for us today to think a little bit about our own individual spiritual journeys uh, that has brought us to this particular congregation in the United Church of Christ. By my count, there are, I think, 14 churches holding services in Palm Springs today. Now that doesn't include our Adventist friends who worshiped yesterday, so if you count them, that's 15 churches. Many of you, like me, grew up in one of those other fellowships. We could be at one of those houses of worship right now, yet we are here. Now why is that? Are we here because of the awe-inspiring architecture of our building? <laughs> are we here because of the Tiffany stained glass windows? Uh, perhaps the massive pipe organ? Clearly not those reasons. Is it because the UCC is the faith tradition that we were maybe all born into? Most likely not, since the information that we have at Bloom is that our members represent between 15 and 20 different former faith traditions. UCC lifers at Bloom are a rare breed indeed. In fact, do me a favor, if any of you grew up in the Congregational Church or the United Church of Christ, raise your hand. Raise your hand, Ruth. Okay. <laughs> Ruth. Paul are here. Okay, that ups the ante. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Uh, we have all chosen to be part of this fellowship. As Reverend Kev, Rev. Kev says, this is not because we think we are better than the other 14 or 15 churches. We just hope that we can offer something that is perhaps not available elsewhere in our community. So I'd like for us to explore this a bit further, and as we do, think about your own faith journey that brought you here. Perhaps you'll be inspired to complete this form that's inside your bulletin. Um, this was created by our moderator, John DiNapoli, a few years ago, and he recently updated it all the way to 2018. You don't have to do it now. Take it home and uh, share your faith journey with us. Bring that back, and we can compile that information into this rich tapestry of where we all came from. And, you know, understand better about, you know, why we are here today. Now, my personal faith journey is fairly unremarkable. It was very easy for me to fill out this form. I spent 29 years in the church I grew up in. I took a 34, 35 year break from any organized religious practice. And then uh, I encountered the United Church of Christ through this congregation. Fairly uninteresting. It was much more bland than my grandparents and great grandparents on both sides of my family some of whom had rather interesting faith journeys. Now we're all familiar with Ancestry.com, 23andMe, these simple DNA samples that uh, you can send in and you get information back that reveals volumes of information about your ancestry. Sometimes surprising information we find out. Now there's no religious component to these tests. If there were, my religious DNA would show a lot of Methodists in one strong line of Disciples of Christ. I identify with neither of these two faith traditions. The faith journeys of my grandparents and great-grandparents on both sides of my family all took them in different directions. I'd like for us to focus on one of these particular faith traditions today because it's one that we in the UCC have a lot in common with. Okay. And those who can't see this don't worry because it's more about keeping me on track today than anything else. <laughs> now we're not going to do a full study of the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but we know the, uh, the Protestant Reformation movement began in 1517. We did a study, Blue Members, last year uh, on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, began with Martin Luther, and his goal was to reform the Catholic Church, not set in motion a proliferation of new faith traditions, but, you know, the invention of the printing press allowed the masses to read the scriptures for themselves and come to their own conclusions, or as we say in the UCC, to think for themselves. Now, if you fast forward about 300 years from the 1517 Protestant Reformation, there is a less well-known movement, uh, an American-based movement rooted in what was then the American frontier. The era was known as the Second Great Awakening or the Restoration Movement. Now, the goal of this radical unity movement was the uniting of Christians through the elimination of denominational labels and creeds and a commitment to restoring the simplicity and sincerity of the early New Testament church. Out of this movement grew the Disciples of Christ Christian Church it's a faith tradition that we in the UCC have a lot in common with. They are our partners in global ministry. We are connected with them jointly through Chapman University. And in just a few weeks, our speaker, to the, our speaker on Sunday will be Nancy Brink. Nancy is an ordained disciples minister with dual standing in the UCC. I've always thought we could probably put a dozen disciples and a dozen UCC folks in the same room, stir them up. Probably couldn't tell much difference. <laughs> now, about the disciples. In the, uh, in the early 1800s, there were three ministers of Scottish Presbyterian heritage. They were living and studying in different parts of what was then considered frontier America. Each of those ministers came to similar conclusions about their Christian faith, and each was unaware of the other's soul-searching work, even though they were just a few states apart. One was Barton W. Stone in Kentucky, and the other two were Thomas and Alexander Campbell, father and son, uh, in Pennsylvania and Virginia, uh, part of Virginia that is now currently West Virginia. Today, their internet blogs would have been read and shared in a matter of minutes. On the frontier of America, it took much, much longer for word to reach each of the other men and their work. Now, their study of the scriptures led them to question denominational creeds and to plead for the unification of all Christians, guided solely by the New Testament. Sort of like that they may all be one, one of our slogans. 
We speak where the Bible speaks. We are silent where the Bible is silent. Lack of dogma and the embracing of radical religious freedom were hallmarks of this movement. The two groups came together in around 1832, and the Stone followers had chosen Christians as their sole identifying name. They wanted to choose a Bible name, and the Campbell followers felt that disciples was a little bit more humble, so they called themselves disciples. Thus, the Merch group became known as the Disciples of Christ Christian Church. And as someone says, confusion has reigned ever since. <laughs> now, just a little aside, there was a small group that was part of this restoration movement that did not join with the Disciples Christian Church. They ultimately ended up in the Congregational Christian Church, which was one of our forerunners. So we're all connected there, one way or the other. Um, now, by then, both of the Campbells and Reverend Stone had been expelled from their respective Presbyterian churches. The disciples were, by design, very loosely organized since the goal was to provide a broad platform that would appeal to denominations to unite with them. Now, this was a very visionary effort to unite Christians largely, and it succeeded, but they did have their detractors. As you can imagine, the established churches of the time felt threatened. They didn't want to see their members leaving and uh, joining this new movement. The followers of Thomas and Alexander Campbell, the father and son, were often called Campbellites. Now, my Aunt Maddie, she always had a snappy reply for that. She said, anytime somebody calls me a Campbellite, I just say, well, better a Campbellite than no light at all. <laughs> she, she didn't mess words. So by the early 1900s, the disciples numbered over one million members, but their loose organizational structure eventually led to some polarization between the more progressive urban churches and the largely rural conservatives. Divisions were exacerbated by the Civil War and two main theological issues, organized missionary societies and the use of instrumental music and worship. The conservatives opposed what they considered the outsourcing of missionary work to a separate self-governing national organization. They also opposed the use of musical instruments since they could find no evidence of their use in the early church. Now, we're not going to get into that today. <laughs> now, by 1906, from all outward appearances, they were two separate faith traditions. They had grown so far apart that they were literally two different groups. Thus, the religious census of 1906 listed the conservatives as Churches of Christ, roughly 10% of the 1.1 million disciples members. Now, in time, this little splinter group's membership doubled that of the disciples. That's what happens in evangelical, you know, movements. The disciples' membership peaked at around 2 million around 1958, and it was roughly the same number of, num of members that the UCC had in 1957 when it was formed through a merger of other like-minded denominations. Now when the disciples reorganized in 1968, they decided they wanted to be organized along a more structured denominational system. Uh, a group within them decided, no, we don't want to go along with that. So another group spun off in 1968, which are now known as the Christian Church, Churches of Christ. You see the need for this. We've got all these names and groups. So, uh, <laughs> So they became known as the Christian Church, Churches of Christ, and uh, the irony of this is that this movement that was intended to unite Christians ultimately re resulted in three more faith traditions. My connection with the disciples is through one set of great-grandparents who were members of the Stony Point Disciples of Christ Church in a small rural community in South Central Alabama. Now something interesting happened at the Stony Point Disciples Church. Reverend Kevin Johnson would probably call it steeplejacking, and that's a term I had never heard until I came to Bloom. Steeplejacking, similar, I suppose, to carjacking, happens when a small group of or individuals exercise their influence to bring about a change in denominational affiliation, abandoning the previous denominational connection. This so-called steeplejacking at the Stony Point Disciples Church occurred in the 1920s. Now this is not too long after the disciples had experienced this original separation of conservatives and progressives. Things were still getting sorted out between the progressives and the conservatives. A conservative-minded preacher arrived in the church community and over a series of weeks or months convinced them that they were in error regarding some of their religious practices. Specifically, the support of independent missionary societies that operated independently of the local congregation, and more specifically, the use of instrumental music in worship. Now, you may think these were insignificant reasons for division, but, you know, wars have been fought over less. Let's remember the Anglican church came about because of a king's desire to divorce his wife. 
According to my recently deceased aunt, this preacher was successful in convincing the entire congregation to unplug the organ and change their affiliation to the conservative churches of Christ. Now amazingly, only two families out of the entire congregation left. However, there was one additional holdout. Aunt Pearl Well. <laughs> now you see Aunt Pearl was the church organist. And apparently she was now out of a job. Her husband, Uncle Bowden, embraced the new affiliation as did all the other family members, but not Aunt Pearl. She wanted nothing to do with it. I inquired of my Aunt Anne, how did all of this play out in the Webb family and the congregation? Well, she said, the church members studied with Aunt Pearl. They prayed with her over a matter for, you know, weeks and weeks. And I said, what happened? My aunt somewhat unconvincingly replied, well, after many weeks of prayer and study, Aunt Pearl decided she would stay. And that was it, I said. My aunt Anne said, well, there was one other thing that I think persuaded her. And what was that, I said. Well, they gave her the organ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I assume Aunt Pearl took the organ home and continued to crank out those favorite pounds. <laughs> So that's how my disciples' relatives all ended up in the Church of Christ. Over time, they brought their, most of their Methodist relatives with them, and most of them are now buried in the church cemetery of the Pine Level United Methodist Church in Elmore County, Alabama. Now, there are certain distinctive traits that we usually associate with conservative faith traditions. Now, I think often of an emphasis on salvation. The plan of salvation was very clearly laid out on a regular basis to me growing up. You hear, you believe, you repent, you confess, and you're baptized, and you're saved. And do not underestimate the importance of baptism. My grandfather on my mother's side of the family was baptized three times. Once as an infant into his family's Methodist church, and later on by full immersion into the Church of Christ. Later in life, he began to have doubts about his baptism. Now, as a child of seven or eight, I recall his extensive deliberations and concerns. Maybe he hadn't gone all the way under the water. I don't know. But I think actually it was more that he had not fully understood the purpose of baptism. So as we say in the South, sometimes people, they don't get saved, they just get wet. <laughs> Surely you've heard that before. So, so one Sunday after church, I accompanied my 62-year-old grandfather and the preacher to one of the elders nearby Pine to be baptized for the third time. We went to the Pine because the congregation had not yet replaced the original 1904 building, which did not have a baptistry. My grandmother did not come along, but instead she caught a ride home to finish preparing the Sunday meal. Rather odd, I thought. Now I stood on the muddy banks while Brother Kirkland and Grandpa Stow went out into the Pine until they were a little more than waist deep. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he was asked? The answer was yes, and he was immersed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now the gravity of Grandpa Stiles wrestling over his baptism, it made a deep impression on me as a child of eight years old, who just four years later would be baptized on July 4th, 1960, Independence Day, in the baptistry of the brand new church building. There was one gnawing aspect of my grandfather's third baptism that continued to trouble me, given its importance. Why had my grandmother not come along to witness it? Now, as a child of eight, you are not encouraged to question most things. But as we rode home in the pickup truck, my grandfather's clothes still dripping wet, I continued to think about it. We sat down to the Sunday midday meal with my grandmother, who had come home directly from church. Though she was supportive that her husband had taken the step, she had little else to say about it. As I continued to silently ponder the reason behind her absence at the fish pond baptism, I could only come to one conclusion. In the South, there is a hierarchy of importance. Near the very top of that hierarchy is preparing the fried chicken. I worry less about salvation today. It's not that I consider it unimportant. I do consider it important. But I believe that it's in God's hands, and worrying about it detracts me from doing God's work. You know, last two Sundays ago, we sang that wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, and insert into our hymnal. I can still sing the fourth verse of that song with as much conviction as I did growing up in my more conservative uh, church upbringing. 
when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, there are no fewer days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Time is infinite in the hereafter. Six years ago, this month, July 20, 2012, I arrived for Sunday services at this church. And this was after a 34, 35 year break from any regular organized religious <coughs> activity. I did not walk in having missed the united part of the name and the sign out front, expecting to find a congregation similar to my childhood and early adult faith. Adult, adult faith. Frankly, I wasn't 100% sure what to expect based upon what I'd heard about this church. Among other things, I had been told the congregation was called Bloom something. It met in leased facilities near the Palm Springs Art Museum. It was independent, non-denominational, and it was gay. I certainly hope our marketing information has improved since then because only the balloon part seemed to be correct by my estimation. I found not only that the meeting space was far away from the Palm Springs Art Museum, <laughs> the congregation appeared diverse in my estimation, not gay, and there was apparently an affiliation with a major Protestant denomination, the United Church of Christ. And what struck me about the affiliation was that it reminded me of my first exposure to the UCC when I was a child of probably 10 or 11 years old living in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, 1958, it was a time of great social change and upheaval in the South as disenfranchised African American citizens sought voting rights and equality. There were often news stories featuring very well-dressed men and women wearing these sandwich board signs, much like this one, but front and back with straps. They simply said, the United Church of Christ. Who are these people, we wondered. The Church of Christ we certainly knew, but not this United Church of Christ. The men and women who showed up during that time of civil rights struggles had traveled from the North, the Northeast, and the Midwest to be silent and sometimes not so silent witnesses for social change at a very important time in American history. They were not always well received, as you can imagine. Outside agitators, they were called by Governor Wallace. Today, I smile, knowing that unintentionally, Governor Wallace nailed it. Agitators, it was an unintended tribute or compliment. And it seems to be a badge that UCC members have worn proudly since then. These people were living out the mission of the newly organized UCC to advocate for justice. Yes, agitating for the disenfranchised, the powerless, the environment, housing, for food security, for underpaid workers, minorities of all stripes, and more recently for marriage equality and just treatment of immigrants. Are we still agitating? Are there still things to agitate for? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, okay, that would be a yes. I think the day that we lose our commitment to agitate, we have probably lost our way. And I hope we will continue to seek opportunities to continue agitating, which, by the way, that's not complaining. Complaining is easy. I do my share of it. Agitating is, you know, walking the talk helping to feed more people every week at the Baptist Church on Rosa Parks Avenue, gathering more usable clothes, towels, toiletries for the clients of Well in the Desert, more pet food for the Buddy and Lucy bags, more backpacks, more support for our UCC 5 for 5 appeals, more support for our conference. Jesus Christ expects nothing less of us. It also requires support and commitment to the 2022 goals that we have collectively set for this congregation. Membership goals, financial permanence goals. Now the folks who met in the Palapas Rose Garden 16 years ago, they had no idea what this church would look like today, even if we would still be here. But they, they put in the effort, the time, the talent, the treasure, treasury, treasure to pay it forward for us. So, you know, I, I personally feel an obligation to do what I can to make sure this congregation is still here five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Amen. I may not be here. Many of, us, many of us won't be. But uh, I, I think because those folks made the sacrifice and paid it forward for us, we can do no less. Now, that's my side pitch for permanence today. <laughs> it's been said that Jesus Christ came to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. That duty has been passed on to us. 
It's okay for us to be comfortable in our beautiful new chairs, but when we leave here every Sunday, I hope we will take a mental image of the admonitions listed on this banner with us, at least one or two of them, and try to live them out each week. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Amen.